Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Additional funding is provided by a generous gift from Irene Hansen who shares your passion for gardening. Additional funding by Mark and Margaret Yakel Jolene in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHill.org. What happens when you are a successful career woman and one day you wake up and say, I have to do something different? The answer for one woman was to create beauty in the world by developing new daylilies. Join me on Prairie Yard and Garden as we explore the world of hybridizing daylilies. Today I have the privilege of talking with Carol Emmerich, who's a daylily hybridizer. Carol, how did you get interested in daylilies? Well, Minnesota is a very tough climate, and you want to grow things that are easy to grow and pest-free and so on. And we know that hostas and daylilies are two of the easiest things to grow in Minnesota. And so I just I went to a national convention and saw that daylilies came in more than orange and yellow and got really excited about it and filled the garden with them. And then how did you come about selecting this piece of property to put all of these daylilies out here? Our home um, is in Edina and it's a shady lot mostly and daylilies love the sun. So if I was going to test and grow daylilies I needed a place that was ideally flat um, with a lot of sunny land with a good water source and so I drew a 30-minute uh, circle around our home in Edina and drove in every direction. And one afternoon, I stumbled onto this piece of property. And it reminded us of Monet's place in France. And all of a sudden, it awakened in us a dream we didn't even know we had. Just went a little small little place just to grow a few plants. But when we saw it, we thought, well, I think we're going to grow plants, but we are also going to um, make it a new garden. And you've got a wonderful site here. How large an area is this? We've probably got 250 acres now. Uh, when we started, we had 110, and we love the area so much, we've just kept adding on. And the original site was, it was um, settled in 1862 by a Swedish immigrant who did the railroad line coming um, down from Minneapolis. Well, did he build the original house, which is a unique feature on the piece of property? He did. Um, 1862, um, he had uh, about 2,000 acres, a couple hundred people working here. He only lasted a year or two. The winters were just too hard. His daughter died of diphtheria. Um, it was all, when you look at the house, you can see these huge um, limestone uh, rocks that he used to build it. The walls are two feet thick, and the basement's all granite and how in the world that many years ago they were able to do that. So as you looked at this piece of property, or was it the right soil type for growing daylilies? We are on top of a gravel pit here. There was no soil uh, up here. There are places on the property that have the most beautiful silty loam that goes down a couple feet, three feet, four feet, six feet some places. And so we basically stripped a lot of that land and we made our own dirt and put it on top of this hill. Obviously, you created the right mixture because the daylilies look just fabulous here. How many daylilies are here? Probably 25,000 different varieties. I make about 5,000 new varieties a year, 
and I've been here since 2000, so I, I try to eliminate as many each year as I make because they may have a flaw that makes them not marketable to the people that I sell to, but their faces are so pretty I can't exactly. work with them. So what characteristics do you look for for the perfect daylily? In Minnesota, what you need, first of all, is the perfect plant under a daylily. You need it to be very hardy. You need good foliage. You need good bud count. And something that I've been able to do uh, that has been difficult in the north is to get them to rebloom. I mean, that's just the plant under it. Nobody will buy a plant, however, if, that, if that's all it has, if the face looks like it's 100 years old. And so I try to have very distinctive, um, just beautiful, drop-dead, gorgeous faces on the plants that will stop people in their tracks and have them say, oh, and make them want to get out of bed in the morning uh -huh. to go look at that, that new bloom. And you talked about the term re-blooming. Can you give me a little explanation of that for our viewers? The part that you see above ground is called a fan, and it does—it kind of looks like, like that, and then the leaves go out like that. Out of each fan usually comes one scape, and on that scape will be the different buds, and each bud will bloom for a day. Rebloom is when, and I, I have what's called instant rebloom, so it's once this scape is up, a new one is starting. And you'll see one later today where I have a third one coming up, which I have never seen before in Minnesota. Uh, I think it's just the good soil that it's in, the amount of water we've had this summer, as well as the heat. Until recently, rebloom, other than little Stelladoro, um, was unheard of on northern day lilies. Well, Carol, can you uh, show us a couple examples of what you're talking about? Sure, there's some right behind us. Why don't we go over there? Great. What characteristics should I look for if I was going out to buy a, a good daylily? Well, first of all, you want a flower that makes you happy. But what makes me happy is really good, clear color. You can see here the color is saturated all the way right. through. There's no spotting on it. I also like a pretty green throat. Um, they don't all come that way, but that's just a personal preference. I look for good bud count. And you can see here, there's probably 20, 25 buds on here because you don't want a um, flower to last just two or three days. Um, you're also looking for good, healthy foliage. You don't know that necessarily ahead of time. That's where you want to do a little research um, before you buy a plant. And there's a lot, there's a lot of information available. Um, it's good to go look at it in person if you can. Do they come in different heights? Yes, daylilies come, um, some are even just 12 inches tall. And then there are others that are as tall as seven feet. Do we grow those in Minnesota? We do grow those in Minnesota. Is there any special things that we do to get a high bud count? Are certain varieties known for that and others? It's genetic, primarily. I mean, you can obviously mess it up if you don't have good soil and if you don't water things. But when, a, when they're introduced to the public, when a hybridizer decides to sell them, they have to list the bud count and they usually list what is it in their garden. Hopefully they're not doing anything special, just in the, I don't do anything special at all, I just put it in the ground. The older daylilies, genetically, most of them had very few buds on them. Hybridizers have been working very hard over the years to increase that bud count. Well, I've got another beautiful looking plant over here. Can you uh, point out to me uh, some of the various parts of that daylily and what makes it unique? Sure, well, the, this big fat thing right here is the fan. The slender thing coming up here is called the scape. And then these are the, the branches coming out. And then these are the buds and an open flower. Each flower, this will be gone tomorrow, uh, which is what a miracle that have all this beauty for one day. Um, but ideally, when you have a, a daylily, when you're looking for one, you have one with the, all these branches coming off the sides here. Uh, so you get a lot of buds coming. Um, the interesting thing about this one is, on this one fan here, what you're going to see is not only do you have this first scape coming, mm -hmm. but there's a second one that when this one um, started to bloom, this next one was almost ready to bloom, and then I have a third one coming out. Now that's very 
uh, rare in Minnesota. I think it helped to have some snow cover and a lot of water this year and, and heat. But, you know, it's doing it on all of the fans. So this is, a, this is really exciting. How do you divide them? Is that the typical way that you would sell plants? Um, yeah, the average person doesn't need to divide their daylilies um, in the north very often. Only if your bud count and scape production starts to diminish would you want to do that. You might be able to leave it in place for 10 years, 15 years. It depends on each plant is different. Some of them, you know, grow out like this and you would never need to divide them. Others sort of grow in on themselves. So you just look at how the health of the plant. They're very different. To divide them, if it's an old plant that you haven't paid very much for, just take yourself a shovel or a pitchfork and pry it apart. On a plant like this, I would be very careful uh, wow. because this is very expensive and I would pry up the whole plant. I would wash off all the dirt so I can see where the fans intersect with each other and I would very carefully with a screwdriver or a knife uh, wiggle them apart and then let the healing, often there's a little wound there and I'd let that heal for um, overnight in the shade um, or actually I put baby powder on it to, to dry it out and then you, then you can replant it. But that is one of the uh, concerns of daylily breeders is the ability to reproduce quickly. And yeah, people say, how do you decide which plant to introduce? And I say, obviously, it has to be beautiful. But maybe the number one characteristic is, does it multiply quickly? And um, so you know, this is one that, that did. This is just a year old plant, and you can see that it's already, I put in, you know, one or two fans, but you can see what big healthy fans and all this branching right away. You want good fast recovery too after planting. We've got an interesting orange, almost a burnt orange color to it. Yes, yep, this is called Clash of Civilizations and I thought of, I try to name my flowers based on what they remind me of and this one is just, it's so loud and noisy and I thought, well good, um, Clash sounds, sounds good there. Well, if you're introducing hundreds of varieties, you've got a challenge coming up with a lot of names. Well, I've only introduced 102 so far, um, but I have a list of about 500 or, yeah, maybe 500, 800. And having, having just the right name um, for just the right plant is the, is the challenge. When I'm ready to introduce it, I'll look through my long list of names and try to see what, 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 what matches that. So you know, the one we first saw was Fear Not. And that just um, it reminded me of the burning bush where God said, you know, don't be afraid. And, you know, this fearfully and wonderfully made, the one we looked at here, is just because it has so many interesting parts to it, all the little different edges. And um, I just thought that's what that reminded me of. So in that process, uh, you're claiming that name. So you have to get this registered someplace? Yeah, you register with the, with the uh, national organization in charge of daylilies. It's called the American Hemorrhocalis Society. It's not patented, but that name is not supposed to be used by anyone else and no reputable um, nursery would sell something that wasn't true to name. How do you document it? You've got to send photos? There's a questionnaire and you have to describe the plant how many branches does it have, how many buds does it have, how tall is it, what color is it, and you have to send a picture. It's, it's only $15 to register it, so a lot of people uh, now, I mean, there's thousands of people who are doing this in their backyard because it's so easy to do, and uh, they name one for Aunt Mary or for a special wedding or a birthday or things like that. And um, you just send it into the National Registrar and you get an answer back within a month and you're good to go. When you're doing the crossing, the breeding, the hybridizing of these varieties, how do you select the parents? Oh, the, th the best part of this are the surprises. You know, some are very predictable breeders. Um, the first one we looked at, Fear Not, will breed beautiful, round, very heavily substanced flowers, but it will go in all kinds of colors. So what's interesting here is actually this, this yellow one beside it is actually out of it, really? which is a surprise, right? So it will go, it will breed purple, it will breed yellow, it will breed all kinds of different colors. The common characteristic is that most of them will be about the same height and they will have this wonderful substance and wonderful green, green in the throat there. The fearfully and wonderfully made here 
uh, intrigues me with the uh, ruffled edge. Yes. Is that a characteristic that's you're trying to breed for many times? Yes, people want fancy flowers in, in my market. You know, it's interesting. They're, they're, they're very different markets. If you go to the average person who comes into the garden, they actually like, they prefer the simple forms, but the collector wants them as gaudy as they can possibly oh. <laughs> have them. And so gaudy means as big an edge as you can have and is, um, they just want them sassy. I have a question. I have many perennials in my garden. When is a good time to divide them? Well, uh, late summer, early fall is a good time for division for lots of our perennials, especially things that are hardy in Minnesota. This is an area in the Arboretum that we just redid, and this is now mid uh, to late August. And so many perennials can be divided at this time. You want to dig up the plants and um, actually cut off some of the foliage. It makes it easier to handle them. And divide uh, the roots either with a shovel, knife, and so on. Sometimes you can actually pull things apart and then go ahead and replant them. The goal in late summer or fall transplanting is that you have at least a month for the plants to reestablish themselves. So they need a whole month, six weeks, two months is great to grow their roots. In the fall, when the um, plants are growing, they have access to usually more water and cooler conditions. And we've had great warm summer weather. The roots will grow long beyond the air temperature falling and being cool. So the soil will remain warm for quite a while. Some of the things that we can transplant and divide in the fall are lilies. Asiatic oriental lilies really do well in the fall. You'll find they've gone from one to several bulbs and you can divide those, move them apart and then transplant them so they're larger. Iris is something else that benefits by division in the fall and you can cut the tops of that back. You want to clean up your iris because of course iris borer can be a problem as well. There are several things, several of our great perennials that you can divide in late summer or early fall. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. Well, Carol, I'm interested in that hybridizing process. Can you demonstrate that for me? Sure. First what I do is I find a flower that is talking to me that day. And this one, as you saw in the plant over there that we were looking at, look how beautiful and clear that um, the ivory color is and what a nice sharp contrast the red mm -hmm. provides in it. And it's a very strong plant. And I like it because it's about six inches and it's got a big edge and it's very fancy. I try to put eyes with eyes. It's just something that I do. And it looks like it might be a good candidate for Fearfully and Wonderfully Made because they're both hardy, they both have good scapes, but this one has an extra super special scape to it as we talked about, and it has the rebloom and the re-rebloom, and so I'm gonna to try to make a plant that is, has a bigger flower, has lots of rebloom, lots of scapes. It'll probably be about this height because they're both similar height, and a, hopefully a six inch flower. And when I put these together, I'll, I'll um, hopefully they both have green throat, so I'll have a green throat out of it. I'll make this band a little bit wider. I won't know quite what color will come out of it. Um, I'll probably have, I'll, each pot will make a number of seeds and some will be the lighter color, some will be the darker color. Some might be a complete surprise, but it'd be nice to have a, a some will have a dark eye that's nice and wide and fancy. And the process is actually very simple. All you do is, um, Take one of these anthers and there's um, all this little yellow fluffy stuff on the end of it mm -hmm. is the pollen. pollen. Mm -hmm. And you just put that on the female part here. It's called the pistil. And there's a little sticky substance on the end of it that forms at different times of the day. It depends on the variety. Sometimes this is ready uh, to be pollinated at six or seven in the morning. Sometimes um, it takes till noon. Sometimes um, it's fine late in the day. Um, and often you can breed late into the evening. And how would you know that? Trial and error. You can actually look at it and there'll be the sticky substance will actually start to form a little uh, bead. Of, um, it looks like um, 
it's, it's, it's very sticky and mm -hmm. it's just a little bead over the top of it. And do you have maybe a magnifying glass at our age to see, yeah. to see what it is? But when I'm breeding, I'm breeding a whole mass of things at once. And so I'm not worried about, is it ready right now? Because the pollen will live all day. Okay. And so when it's ready, uh, that sticky substance comes up there and then it drags it down to the base of the flower here. Mm -hmm. And there's an ovary down there. And if it takes, overnight a little tiny pod will actually start to form and um, that's one reason when you're in a, a hybridizer's garden you don't ever want to take off the dead blooms for them because they might have just made a baby to warn people about that what i do is this would be my symbol this year for this pollen parent and so when in my books i would write down banner of love big yellow paper clip with orange and I would stick that on right there just like that and that would tell me that this has been pollinated and this is the parent so that 45 to 60 days from now when that pod is formed and starts to crack open and the seeds are ready to be harvested I'll know which ones were my parents. How do you know that this little flower hasn't been pollinated already? That's an issue when you have small flowers or when you have what's called diploids. I only breed in tetraploids. Dip, uh, tetraploids tend to have these much longer pistils, so um, they're away from the pollen down in there. If I was doing it outside, I would prefer to do it early in the morning before any of the insects had gotten out and even before the pollen is ripe. Because what you can do actually is you can pick this flower and put it in the refrigerator. Mm and it'll, the pollen will still be good the next day and the next day. And so you can get up at 6 in the morning before you go to work, and you can make that cross, and the sticky stuff won't be on there, but it'll be there in a couple hours. And so you can go to work knowing that your cross is probably took, and it's cool, um, which is an advantage in hybridizing. This summer's been horrible right. for breeding because of the, the heat just, it just kills the pollen. So now we've got the, the cross made. Mm -hmm. How many seeds will be formed in this union? Sometimes nothing. There are the genetics are you know it's it's just like um, human beings. For some reason, some people can't bear children. Usually, pollen is good. It's it, pollen is almost always good unless it's white, and that sort of tells you it's no good. But uh, the pollen is usually good. Uh, but some are weaker and some are stronger. But uh, there are many plants that, through their breeding, have become pretty sterile. But I try to pick plants when I'm breeding that are really strong and make make the seeds. Hopefully they'll start, you know, tonight. And so now I've got all of these seeds in this pod. Uh, sometimes there's as many as 30. The typical um, number on a tetraploid breeding is eight. And they're, each one of those, when the genes combine, potentially give you a unique flower. Yes. You would not get eight similar flowers from that breeding. They might be similar, but they'll not be identical. Okay. There is no such thing as identical kids in that pod. And usually they will bear some characteristics. Uh, they'll usually look like the parents, just like, you know, in your own family sure. with your own kids. But sometimes they'll look like Uncle Henry or Aunt Mary and go back a few generations. Um, but each, each flower is different. There's some, actually, they're so strong that most of the babies look just like them. And that's not the goal here. What you want to do is breed with ones that produce a lot of variety because the, the fun of this is seeing things that you have never, ever seen before. That, that's what would get me excited. But now I made that cross, how long do I got to wait before I can have ripe seeds to be replanted and then get a new plant to uh, show me what it's going to look like? For the backyard hybridizer, and as I showed you, anybody can do this. This is really simple. You sure. can just go in, anybody can do it in the backyard. Thousands of people do it. There should be a, a pod forming, um, and in 45 to 60 days, so if it's now early August, that would be early October, and you want it, hopefully it'll ripen before frost, because the seeds don't like frost. And if you do, um, if it looks like frost is coming, you can actually cut off the scape and put it in water, and the pod will mature right there and you wait for the pod to open up so as I said 45 to 60 days and then most people in Minnesota would put that in the refrigerator over to simulate winter mm -hmm. and then come February or March or April you would put it in some sterile 
mix so that it doesn't damp off and just try to get it germinated. And then you get this little wisp of the thing coming up, a little, little tiny blade, it looks a little blade of grass, and that you can just plant outside. At which point, uh, if this is 2010, you would plant that outside in June of 2011 after all frost had passed. You might see a plant in uh, 2013, and, but it would probably be a clump by 2014. So that's quite, you know, that's um, three or four years from now before you would see something. Uh, you might get lucky and see something in 2012, but probably not. In the greenhouse, though, I can see them in seven months. Really? So what I would do is I, I make my seeds there in May, and I plant the seed in early August, and I will see it in April. And that's what's let me, as a northern hybridizer, keep up with the people who do this in Florida. Well, the advantage of being able to bloom in the greenhouse in seven months is that I'll know if my good ideas worked or if they didn't. And if they did, I can run with them and make more of that same cross or take that um, offspring, which is usually what I do because the offspring uh, is much more exciting to work with than something I've worked with before. And I can um, make seeds with that and we're off to the races. How many crosses do you make to get one successful new plant? The rule of thumb historically has been for the average backyard person, you'd have to have um, a thousand seeds to before you'd get one that had a qualities that was really worth introducing to the public. My rate is much better than that. Um, it can be, depends on, it depends on the parents. For some parents it could be as good as one out of every 50 seeds. If I plant 4,000 seeds a year, I'm hoping to get 15 to 20 introduction quality plants out of that. Labor of love. It is a labor of love. It is la labor, heavy on the labor. <laughs> <laughs> heavy on the labor because, yeah, people say, well, why does this particular plant here, why did this cost $100 this year? Well, if you had any idea of the thousand that I had to throw away and weed and water and fertilize and pay for the gas and all of that. It's a very inexpensive price to pay for uh, something. A, a uh, real beauty. It's, it's brand new. Mm -hmm. Well, Carol, I want to thank you for this most interesting conversation about daylilies. It's been a learning experience for me. Good. It was fun. Thanks. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Additional funding is provided by a generous gift from Irene Hansen, who shares your passion for gardening. Closed captioning is provided by Mark and Margaret Jackal Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalom Hill dot o r g